Coming up on Market to Market. Rains dampen the Corn Belt yet again, pushing the mighty Mississippi to flood stage. Senate lawmakers move one step closer to a final vote on the Farm Bill. And persistent drought in Colorado results in smaller herds and paychecks for ranchers. Those stories and market analysis with Don Rose, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success. This is the Friday, June 7 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The government released its latest jobs report Friday and the numbers boosted prospects of continued economic recovery. According to the Labor Department, U.S. employers added 175,000 positions to their payrolls in May, indicating that businesses continue to hire at a modest but steady pace despite government spending cuts and tax increases. The unemployment rate, however, ticked up one-tenth of a point to 7.6 percent. But that was because more people began looking for work, and the numbers suggest about 75 percent of them actually landed jobs. The labor report was cheered on Wall Street, where the Dow gained more than 200 points on the news. The week began on a bullish note Monday, when the automobile industry reported U.S. consumers bought 1.4 million vehicles last month, up 8 percent from last May. Much of the move was powered by trucks, and sales of full-size pickups increased 26 percent over last year. Many of those trucks, of course, are working hard in rural America, where weeks of cool and wet weather have complicated life for growers. And in what's beginning to sound like a broken record, the big story in farm country yet again this week is Mother Nature. Heavy rains in the Corn Belt are starting to cause major problems downstream. Areas still recovering from earlier spring flooding are back in the trenches again, hoping for drier conditions. In the Missouri town of West Alton, a makeshift levee was breached early this week, and now residents of the town of 570 are on high alert. West Alton was nearly swept away 20 years ago in the Great Flood of 1993. Those who live in the community close to the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi River are preparing for the worst. There's a culvert over here that's breached and it's coming in through the culvert and they said don't be alarmed right now but definitely be on standby. The community's makeshift levee has officials with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers monitoring the area north of St. Louis closely. The entire levee system uh, right now has water on it from uh, both the Mississippi side as well as the Missouri side. Um, both of those areas are concerning. Uh, we, we, we never want water on a levee, uh, but, but it happens, that's why they're there. At least four locks were closed this week because of the high water, but recent rains have offered some relief from the most arid conditions in half a century. The latest drought monitor from the University of Nebraska reveals 55% of the contiguous United States is in one of five stages of drought. That's the lowest level in almost 17 months. Significant rain in the Great Plains, Midwest, and northern interior portions of the West helped ease drought conditions. As the rain falls in portions of the Grain Belt, crop progress continues to lag. USDA's weekly report indicates corn planting is 91 percent complete, trailing the five-year average by four percentage points. The condition of the emerged corn is 93 percent in the fair to excellent categories. Soybeans are significantly further behind schedule. USDA pegs 57% of the crop is planted, well off the average pace of 74%. Spring wheat planting is also behind schedule. 80% of the fields have been sown, 12 percentage points below the five-year average. Winter wheat, however, is showing the effects of previously dry conditions, and 68% of the U.S. crop is rated fair to very poor. While dry conditions reduce winter wheat production this year, multiple years of drought have forced many cattle producers to cull their herds. Nationally, the U.S. cattle herd stands at 96 million head, making it the smallest since 1952. Now that seems like a textbook case for higher prices, but there's a limit to how much consumers will pay and plenty of competition from other sources of protein. Per capita beef consumption has declined for at least two decades, and slumping demand has resulted in a 10 percent decline in futures prices this year, despite historically tight supplies. Colorado has the seventh largest cattle herd in America, and with annual cash receipts of more than $3 billion, the industry accounts for nearly 50 percent of the state's agricultural sales. 
But as Dave Miller discovered this spring, persistent drought is weighing heavily on Rocky Mountain ranchers. Tim Canterbury runs a cow-calf operation in the high country near Howard, Colorado. Canterbury, along with his son Ryan, run about 300 cows and their calves on the family ranch situated along the Sangre de Cristo mountain range. Normally, the cattle would be eating meadow grasses, but the drought gripping Colorado for the past two years has reduced new growth. As the arid conditions drag into a third year, Canterbury is digging into his reserve of hay that his son and brother Bill harvested last season. In a good year, the trio would roll up 1,500 bales, but the extreme lack of moisture cut that number to just 300. Everybody else was in the same mode and trying to figure out how to, how to survive. So we've had to make some, some really uh, drastic management choices. Um, not that we wanted to, uh, but because of necessity, we just had to. So I guess the trigger point was last fall. We didn't have the, the hay, um, had, to, had to purchase hay. Uh, we had about 20%, 25% of normal hay production here in 12. While the fifth generation rancher and his son each managed separate herds, they were faced with the same problem of high feed costs and lack of moisture. The issue forced the Canterbury's to sell off nearly half of their stock, culling at least 280 head between both ranchers. While an easy fix might be waiting for things to pencil out and buy back animals, there is a catch. The cattle the Canterbury's need for replacements must be bred for high altitude. Animals without the right genetic makeup run the risk of suffering from bovine high mountain disease, more commonly known as brisket disease. At heights of over 3,000 feet, fluid can form around a cow's heart, potentially killing the animal. That concern is foremost in their minds when they select replacement cattle, because a good share of the 35,000 acres of pasture the Canterbury's either rent or own is at 7,500 feet above sea level. We can't just go down to the market and buy cows and replace cows. It's a little, little tougher out here and you have to have that, be able to find those high altitude cattle or else save your heifers and come back. When you've sold 45, 50% of your cow herd, um, it, it's gonna hurt. And uh, it's definitely gonna take us a little time to get back. Last year, Canterbury realized he might be forced to sell off some cattle insufficient meadow grass, a smaller than normal hay crop, and reduced grazing days on Bureau of Land Management Meadows made it clear changes would have to be made. The issue has forced family members to think about taking off-ranch jobs for the first time in many years. Due to the drought, I have to get a, a second job, and in some cases a third. I work in the construction business now. Um, a lot of building, a lot of excavation work, things of that nature. Um, because they just don't have the amount of cows. I've had to sell a lot of cows in this drought. Last fall, the Canterbury sold some of their cattle. They received $70 per hundred weight for the best animals, but many sold for $60 per hundred, a price lower than what the senior Canterbury felt the animals were worth. Either way, the decision was clear cut. You know, I, I guess that we, we got to start looking at the balance sheet. Obviously, um, you know, uh, my son's had to take an outside job. Um, and, and I'll tell you what, I, I'm right on the brink of it. Um, you know, you, you get in the, under 100 head of mother cows and it's really tough to pay the bills. The bills for this ranch that normally has 300 mother cows on it um, are the same. It doesn't matter whether there's 300 mother cows or 100 mother cows, those bills are the same. The slump in the cattle market has impacted ranchers in all phases of beef production, including those who breed top genetics into replacement cattle. Mitch Rohr is the chief operating officer for the Spruce Mountain Ranch in Larkspur, Colorado. We're not experiencing a drop in price. In fact, in 2012, our average price per animal sold was higher than we've ever had. However, we didn't sell as many. Uh, so people are very limited, uh, producers, cow-calf, ranchers, farmers, they're limited on their production because of the cost, the high hay cost, the high grain cost, and no pasture. And it's hard to look a year down the road or two years down the road and say, we need to survive this. We need to uh, 
really work through how we do this so we can capitalize on the market down the road. Spruce Mountain's primary business is selling registered Black Angus replacement cattle to cow-calf operations. Along with choosing blue ribbon traits, Roar keeps a close eye on the habits of beef consumers. What I'm seeing being around the metro areas, we're seeing a lot of families still go out to eat, still order steak, beef, hamburgers, what, what have you. Um, we're just not seeing them quite as often. Maybe they used to go out two or three times a week, now they're going out once a week. They will spend a little more that one time based upon our surveys and, and the data that we've been able to compile. However, when you go back to the beginning of the, of the beef chain, what I'd consider the seed stock producer, that affects us indirectly. So we have to kind of watch those forecasted markets and say, okay, how do we improve what we do, less input costs, but still achieve that output and, and create that revenue for our operation. Spruce Mountain started its Angus operations six years ago. Much of the herd is raised at the East Ranch near Kiowa, Colorado, about 45 minutes from the home office. For several years, forage needs for the thousand head of cattle were handled within an hour of the 16,000 acre operation. Now Roar is forced to travel more than 10 times that distance to find hay. The past couple of years, we've seen the prices go up, not so much that you can't find the hay, um, and not so much that the price of the hay is so high that you can't afford it. It's the fuel cost. It's the trucking. We have to reach farther out. Instead of going 50 or 60 miles to help bring in some supplemental hay resources, we have to go out five, 600 miles. Roar is concerned about the future and is working hard to avoid reducing numbers in a herd that he has invested time, hard work, and tons of feed. Nobody likes a quitter. So I'd say right now, we're not even looking down that road. We gotta stay positive. There's a lot of people that look from the outside in, whether it be from a metro area, whether it be from uh, a rural area, they look in and they want leaders and we're trying to step up to that point and also help equip others with our genetics to, to be in the forefront of that. Roar and Canterbury remain optimistic and both men are conscious of the legacy they will leave behind. You know, this ranch is, has always been my life. Um, born and raised here, uh, it's, it's what I love to do. It's, it was uh, opportunity, you know, for me, and uh, I want to pass that opportunity to my sons. Um, I have two sons. Uh, you've met my young son, and uh, I'm not saying that they have to stay on this ranch but I'm saying I want to give them the opportunity to make their own decision whether this is what they want to do or not. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. Two international agencies estimated this week that rising global demand for food will push up prices 10 to 40 percent over the next decade, and governments need to boost investment to increase farm production. According to Food and Agriculture Organization and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, growth in food production has slowed over the past decade, even as rising incomes in developing countries boosted consumption. Noting that higher prices will make their biggest impact in developing countries where some families spend up to 60% of their income on food, the agencies urged governments to avoid interfering with market forces. But some would argue that's exactly what's going on these days in Congress, where lawmakers are trying to hammer out a compromise over federal spending for agricultural and nutritional programs. But we're looking at uh, heading down a path, Madam President, that takes us not to the future, but to the past to a time when farmers were farming for the government program rather than farming for the market. Late this week, the U.S. Senate voted to end debate on amendments to the Agriculture Reform Food and Jobs Act, more commonly known as the Farm Bill. The Senate version of the bill is estimated to cost taxpayers nearly $955 billion over the next decade. Despite that hefty price tag, the measure would still cut federal spending by as much as $24 billion over that same time period. Much of the savings would be realized by cutting farm programs like direct payments, which compensate growers regardless of prices or yields. The Senate measure also would tie subsidies to environmental standards and reduce the government's share of crop insurance premiums by 15 percent 
for farmers whose gross adjusted income exceeds $750,000 annually. Nearly $4 billion of savings would come from cuts to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. With annual costs of about $78 billion, SNAP spending has more than doubled since 2008. More than 47 million people received assistance through the program last year. House Republicans contend SNAP needs an overhaul, but Senate Democrats have been reluctant to make changes. The House version of the Farm Bill, which emerged from committee last month but is yet to make its way to the floor, takes a much larger slice out of the SNAP program, cutting five times as much as the Senate plan. We could do so much better, Madam President, and we should do so much better for our producers across this country and for the taxpayers who ultimately foot the bill. And the Thursday's Senate vote ending debate on amendments means lawmakers, at least on the Senate side, can proceed with debate on the comprehensive legislation and presumably a final vote next week. Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain prices were mixed this week as wheat prices trended lower while old crop corn futures eked out a modest gain. For the week, July wheat lost nearly 10 cents, while the nearby corn contract moved about a nickel higher. Old crop soybeans also rallied as the July contract gained 19 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with an upward move of $5.25 per ton. In the softs, cotton broke out of its slump as the December contract posted a weekly gain of $3.12 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, June Class 3 milk advanced by nearly 30 cents, while the July contract gained 27 cents. Over in livestock, the August cattle contract lost $1.17. August feeders were off nearly 60 cents, but the July lean hog contract gained $2.70. In the financials, the euro gained 252 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil advanced by more than $4 per barrel. Comex Gold declined by $10 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index moved nearly 20 points higher to settle at 632.80. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Don Rose. Don, welcome back. Thank you. We mentioned there in the lead up, we saw the dollar come under pressure this week. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's driving that? What did we see in the currency market that caused that to happen this week? Well, one thing, the, the dollar had a lot of strength for a long time, and I think a lot of it goes back to the interest rates. It seems like, you know, when we think the interest rates are going to start to uh, move higher, the dollar comes under some pressure and, and vice versa when uh, it happens the other way. So I think it's that, but still the dollar, although it's at a low level, still the best of the worst currency. Okay. All right. Now, let's take a look at wheat. We've seen the U.S. wheat market, uh, U.S. wheat producers under a lot of pressure with fr frosts and, and floods and all these uh, negative things. Talk to me a little bit about new crop wheat production. What do you expect there? Where are prices going to head? Well, the big problem that you have with the wheat market is not in the U.S. market. U.S. Uh, market, you know, where our supplies are going to be down, our production is going to be down, but it's more about the world production. We've got uh, Canada, we've got uh, Australia, Argentina, uh, the EU, the Black Sea area, all are going to have increased production. So that's the issue that we have. And consequently, for example, hard red winter wheat, uh, you know, a few months back was 9.50 a bushel, now it's 7.50. It's harvest time. We've had a lot of problems, but we're uh, still under some pressure. Advice to producers out there looking at this situation? Well, unfortunately, I mean, you, when you look at the wheat market from a global standpoint, while we've got tighter supplies here, we've got excess in the, in the world. And so our advice actually is to go to work and uh, pre uh, take advantage of some of the carries in the market. And uh, at these areas, I would look at selling uh, March 14 wheat in Chicago and Kansas City and see if we can come under pressure and maybe move down somewhere in the 50 cent uh, bushel area from here. Okay, start planning ahead for next year and, uh, and be proactive. Yeah, and I think it's really we're coming into harvest. You know, regardless of the size, we're still going to have a harvest here and around the world we're going to have a harvest. So I think it's more of that time of year than anything else. All right. Well, let's take a look at corn. Uh, we've seen a continued inverse relationship there, old crop versus new crop. We saw new crop uh, up a little bit this week. Talk to us, excuse me, old crop. Talk to us a little bit about the old crop corn situation and then your predictions on new crop. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the old crop has been tight here for a long time, and supplies are still razor tight. The uh, basis levels are historically tight. 
and uh, we're trying to just walk along, get to the new crop where we thought we were going to have adequate supplies. Well, now we're not so certain. But we do know that at the end of July we're going to have a bigger uh, wheat harvest, and that's going to help us uh, buffer some of it. We do know we're going to have some imports uh, of uh, corn from uh, Brazil into the United States, so that's given us a buffer. But, uh, you know, the market, as we know, it's all about uh, the weather uh, this time of year. And the weather, we thought a month ago it was going to be conducive to a large crop, and now we've got uh, probably probably about 6 million uh, acres of uh, corn at risk. We were uh, uh, northern, and they're in some key areas, Mike. They're in uh, Iowa, uh, northern Iowa, northeast Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Illinois, that area about five uh, and a half million acres, and then uh, North Dakota about a half a million acres. So it's, it's going to be all about weather. But what the market's trying to say is the good areas are making up for the bad areas. And we're going to find out. We're going to look at the uh, crop ratings from here going forward and see if that is true. Um, you know, remember a year ago, we had the same type of thing. We took uh, December corn all the way down to 499, and it was the uh, middle of June, June 17th, the market took off to the upside. That's right. So it's all going to be weather dependent. Advice to producers looking at their fields as they stand now. What's the best way to, to handle this upcoming year, new crop corn? Well, unfortunately, what producers are doing right now in a lot of areas, you know, it's late on corn and just starting to plant for the insurance period. Uh, from a marketing standpoint, I think this is another good year to look at some of these alternative uh, strategies. Uh, you know, rather than having tight sales, you can do some of these window contracts that give you a lot of the flexibility. It's also a good time to look at some of these short dated new crop options, which, you know, are, have just come into the marketplace here recently. So there's some things you can do to product yourself, but, uh, you know, it's going to be a key. T I think the one thing we have going forward so far here, Mike, and that's really what the market is about, the crop so far is not getting bigger, it's getting smaller. So look for signs of the crop stabilizing and starting to go the other way. All right. Well, now let's take a look at soybeans as we talk about all these acres at risk. Are we going to see increased soybean plantings for new crop? I think that's what the trade thought for a long time. I think as you went home on Friday, uh, new crop soybeans were actually up 16 cents on the week where new crop corn was down 8 cents. So while we're pretty mature on the plantings in corn, we're not so sure on the soybeans. We still have about 20 million acres of soybeans to plant. And so I think that's going to be the big issue, uh, you know, do they get planted in a timely fashion? Then remember, it's all about August weather on soybeans. And uh, you could have a carryover of 300, 350 million, but if the yield uh, dips, remember each bushel is about 78 million uh, uh, bushels on your total production. So you lose four bushels, you're back to 260 million bushels pretty fast on loss. So it's all going to be about August weather. So this would be another good example to perhaps take advantage of those short dated contracts or something that's gonna give you a little bit more flexibility this year? Oh, I think most definitely. And if you look at it just from a fundamental standpoint, but it, uh, uh, the soybean market is overvalued uh, at $13 a bushel, there's no doubt about it. But uh, when you look at the carries in the market, the structure in the market's much better on soybeans. There's only a three cent carry from November to July 14. That's uh, eight months. Where you look in corn, there's seven months and we have a 24 cent carry. So the market is much more comfortable with a supply on, on corn than it is on soybeans. All right. Well, now let's take a look at livestock. As you look at the live cattle market, the way it stands, what are your thoughts? It's been a rough year. Any brightness on the horizon for cattle feeders? The, the cattle market, I think it just got way ahead of itself. You know, last uh, December, you could have sold uh, April cattle at 138. And, you know, then uh, obviously the trade was thinking it was going a lot higher. Now people are beat down where, you know, actually we have discounts in the market. Uh, we're, we're on a, a typical seasonal break where we usually drop 11% uh, from the uh, uh, spring high to the summer low. Uh, the old, you know, so we should take the cash market down to about, we'll say, 116 to 119. We traded on Friday at 122. Uh, I think when you look forward, we probably have a chance for a counter-seasonal because we're going to have our uh, lowest. Actually, we're going to have a decrease in beef production uh, going into the third quarter. That's the first time that's happened in 17 years. So, you know, there are some big positives here. And then the production next year is obviously, uh, you know, positive. And cattle across the board are undervalued out in those deferred months. But we have to look at and wait our turn for the market to stabilize. All right. And in feeders, uh, cost of feed has been the overriding concern for so many people. And any bright spots there on the feeder market? 
Well, you're right. I mean, the uh, feeder cattle market this week, again, was about the corn market. And, you know, the corn market goes up on Friday. The feeder cattle market goes down a dollar. But the feeder cattle uh, supplies, uh, you know, are pretty tight. They're going to be tight going forward. But the whole beef situation boils down to uh, what's the consumer going to bear? And do we lose market share going forward? And all of that's going to be uh, something that we're going to sort out in the marketplace going forward. I think what we're going to find is that, that beef is still going to be uh, uh, very much in big demand. Okay. Now, as we look at our export sales, particularly of protein, how does the future look there? Uh, we know we've got issues with Russia and China importing our, our meat and our meat. Any chance that's going to change in the near term? I think when you look at it, I think, you know, with the dollar down at these levels, I think there's optimism that the uh, export pace is going to uh, pick up and uh, moving forward. I know our industry is working very hard to keep uh, uh, the export strong. Our pork exports are about 25, 24 percent of our production. The beef's about 9 percent. So, you know, on the pork, it's a, it's a big item. It's a key item. And we've got confidence that going forward that our exports will sp- uh, expand. You know, we have had a lot of news with uh, Chinese exports and exports going forward uh, this last two weeks, and so we think that there's underlying strength in the export market. All right, looking at the hog market, we did see a big run-up this week in prices, about a $2.70 move. What can we attribute that to? When you look at the hog market, they're an overachiever. The cattle are an underachiever, but the uh, hog market, really, we have a marketing hole. We just don't have the numbers right now. The Packers uh, chasing the cash market higher, and he's been the driving force. The cutout's been moving up at the same time. But what that's really done is it's pushed some of these uh, back months, I would say October, maybe even August, but probably October forward, you were probably uh, over our economic values. You know, realistically, uh, our pork supplies in the fourth quarter are going to increase the most that they have since 2007. So we're going to have a lot of pork coming at us at the fourth quarter going forward. And realistically, cash hog uh, values, probably 70 to $74 in the fourth quarter is not out of line. Okay. And going forward for the year, you know, you could have uh, air values, you know, 70 to uh, 85. All right. Well, thank you so much, Don. Before we let you go, there was a brief breaking story about anthrax in Minnesota. Quick take, any effect on Monday market opening, Sunday market opening? You know, I don't think so. I think it was an isolated case. It was one cow. So I think that we're going to uh, walk right through that. All right. Thank you so much, Don. Really appreciate your insight. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But if you'd like more information from Don on where these markets just may be headed, visit the Market Plus page at our website. You'll find expanded market analysis, audio podcasts, and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed and Facebook account, all free at the Market to Market website. Be sure to join us again next week when we'll examine the market impact of the Agriculture Department's latest imp- estimates on s- global supply and demand. So until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success.